name is Meg Gray. I'm the science and technology librarian here at the library. And this is Jessica Burton, executive director of the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. And together we organize this series and we're going on our fourth year. Um, one little housekeeping note is that there is a survey. So if you see it on your chair, librarians love data. So if you would fill it out and put it in the back, that would be great. And now I'm going to have Jess talk a little bit about what she does. Um, thanks, Meg. Uh, Jess Burton with the Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative. We're an organization based here in Portland that's focused on building partnerships uh, between organizations, conservation organizations, and more for greater impact and to broaden the conversation um, of conservation, for conservation, about conservation. Our partnership with the library is a really good example of how we work in partnership and this is one of my most favorite things of the work that I do because um, Meg and I work together to find speakers and to bring in you know, these topics. And it's wonderful to see people from all over come to these talks. We're working on our series for 2020. We have a few things on the list, but if anybody has an idea or something that they've been thinking about or know about, we'd be happy to hear about that. Um, and tonight we're really excited to hear uh, from Troy, uh, from the city of Portland, uh, and we're super excited because he was here a year ago and talked about different things. It's the start of this, so it's really cool one year later. So next year, we will also be back hearing the next iteration. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thanks for that awesome welcome, and um, thanks everybody for uh, for coming out tonight. Um, as I said, I'm Troy Moon. I'm the sustainability coordinator uh, for the city of Portland, and uh, I've been work. I've worked for the city for over 20 years, mostly in the environmental um, space, uh, working on everything from recycling to um, working in parks and working in urban agriculture. Um, so what I've been really impressed by is in the last couple, last few years, we just really picked up momentum, really started to make a lot of progress um, on climate issues, um, particularly. Um, so that's really really gratifying. Being able to do a lot of projects that we kind of imagined for years that they're just you know finally finally getting them out. Really appreciate the support we're getting from you know the city manager and from our elected officials who are really um, really taking sustainability and, and climate uh, to heart. So. Tonight, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the impacts we are expecting from climate change, um, some of the things we see coming down the pike, um, and then I'll talk about our one climate future uh, climate action planning process that we're engaged with um, with the city of South Portland. And so just a little bit more about us. Um, we have, uh, in, in Portland and South Portland, we both have uh, two person sustainability offices, um, and so, um, in Portland, myself, and we have Ashley Krulik, and say hi, Ashley. And um, in, in South Portland, our colleagues are Julie Rosenbach and Lucy Brennan. And so we um, collaborate on all kinds of different things um, because we have pretty much the same mission. Our goal is to uh, promote a sustainable community now and in the future. And as you can tell, there's only two of us in each of our offices, so we can't possibly make our communities more sustainable just with four people. It's really, it really takes everybody in the community uh, to, make it, to make it sustainable. So we partner with folks like at the library. Uh, we work with community partners, Friends of Casco Bay, uh, Sierra Club, Portland Climate Action Team, um, Portland Society for Architecture is an amazing partner we work with. And we're starting to work with uh, area businesses as well. So we've done One Climate Future presentations at Allagash Tasting Room and at Tandem Coffee at their bakery. Um, so really, we're trying to get out and involve everybody, everyone we can, to um, be involved in um, you know, talking about how we can make Portland more sustainable, um, build community resilience, um, just you know, through collaboration and getting everybody to know each other more. Um, some of the things that we work on together with South Portland, we both, like I said, we both have the same goals. Um, we have the same climate commitments. Um, so we collaborate a lot, everything on energy policy and implementation. So um, in the last legislative session, um, both Julie and I spent um, quite a lot of time in Augusta working on, um, on it's mostly on solar policy, but also on um, working to make Maine have a much more rigorous um, energy building code. Um, so. 
that takes some time. And we're, you know, we're pleased that that's been pretty successful. Both cities have now upgraded their streetlights to LED. Um, so we've gone away from the highly energy intensive, you know, high pressure sodium lights to, you know, very efficient LED lights that have basically reduced our, the city's electrical um, usage went down 8% since we switched to LED lights. So it's been a huge, uh, huge help. Um, we work on uh, waste, solid waste issues, so uh, recycling and composting, and we recently, uh, in the city of Portland, um, banned plastic straws, so starting in April, um, you have a few months to get ready, no more straws after April. Um, we have a pesticide ordinance in both cities, we've banned the use of synthetic pesticides. Portland and South Portland have the most um, restrictive um, pesticide ordinances in the country, um, so we're really setting the pace there. Uh, one thing that we're pretty excited about as well is energy benchmarking. Um, you'll see later that um, build, the building sector is a huge contributor to the city of Portland's greenhouse gas emissions and really don't know enough about um, how buildings, especially commercial buildings, are using energy. So starting in May of 2020, our first group of buildings will have to be reporting all of the energy and water um, that they use on an annual basis to our office and we can start kind of looking at the data and to try to understand you know, which buildings are, you know, are inefficient and how can we target um, some, you know, technical assistance and programs at people who own buildings that can you know, help them make, help make them more efficient, help them save money, but also help them reduce carbon emissions. And we're working really, really hard to attain our climate goals. And like I mentioned, both Portland and South Portland have the same climate goals. So our councils have committed to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. Um, and we've also agreed, uh, committed to reduce, to run our cities on 100% renewable energy by 2040. Um, but if you've been reading the news recently, um, you may have seen that um, both the councils in Portland and South Portland have declared um, a, a state of climate emergency. And really, we have to uh, credit youth activism for that. Um, you can see this, there's, this is a picture from um, the climate strike in and this was the one in March, um, but with, and then there was another one in September. So youth leadership um, on climate has been really, really important to really make sure that people, that it's really stays on people's minds, to make, sure, you know, make the elected officials and people in the administration really understand that young people particularly are very serious and very concerned about um, climate change. And so the, the youth um, leaders um, asked the city council to declare a climate emergency but, and then also to take steps to end fossil fuel use by 2030. So it's a, it's a steep bar, um, but youth argue that you know, it's important that we make these steps now in order to um, have a climate where that their future um, can be um, better than it will be if we continue on the path we are now. So hats off to uh, the youth climate leaders. And just uh, kind of get uh, spend a little bit of time kind of digging into um, the cl you know climate impacts. Do, does anybody know who who this guy is? James Hansen. That's right. And so this picture uh, was taken in 1987, and he's testifying in front of the Congress, um, and he's telling our government that it's pretty clear and we're certain that human. Humans are causing climate change. Humans are causing the atmosphere to warm, and it's because of burning fossil fuels. And he told us that in 1987. But uh, since he gave his talk, um, we've seen uh, emissions continue, continue to increase. And in fact, since 1987, um, we've burned more fossil fuels than we did in all the years prior to 1987. So we're completely going the wrong way. And in fact, um, the last three years we've seen increases. This year, um, worldwide, we're expecting to see 36 billion tons of CO2, CO2 equivalent. So um, even though renewable energy is starting to take hold, um, energy use continues to expand around the world. Um, and so we're, not, we're just not seeing um, the reductions we need to see. Um, so in Portland, you know, we certainly are contributing um, if you add up our total ton of, you know, our total CO2 emissions, it's just, you know, a speck in the worldwide emissions, but, you know, we have to uh, take care of um, our own house as well. 
Um, you can see um, the different sectors that um, contribute to our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Ultimately, it boils down to about 60% of our emissions come from the building sector, um, residences and commercial buildings, which is different, um, different from the state because you know, we're more, or, more urban. Transportation accounts for the, the majority of the state's emissions, but uh, buildings here in Portland, but you know, transportation still counts for over 30% of uh, emissions from Portland. So these are areas that we're going to be needing to do a lot of work for sure. Um, and just to get into a little bit about some of the uh, impacts we're expecting to see um, in the upcoming years, uh, particularly if we don't take actions to um, reduce our emissions in the short term. Um, the first one I want to mention, well, first I want to talk a little about scenarios because um, some of the charts we'll see up in the future, and if you hear people talking about um, different um, sea level rise scenarios or climate change scenarios, these are the ones that are most common and certainly the ones that we use in our planning process. So there's um, it's called RCP 2.6, which is kind of a low, low emission scenario. That assumes that um, we are able to get our act together in the next year or so and start really dramatically reducing our emissions. Um, if, you know, this would be if we were able to kind of meet the, uh, meet the targets that the youth leaders have asked us to meet and end fossil fuel use by 2030, we could, we could probably um, meet the 2.6 scenario, which still calls for a, a a global temperature increase of about two degrees C, um, which you know it's, it's bad enough. But in terms of a planning horizon, we're kind of hoping that this you know the models we're looking at or we're planning towards foreseeable rise are based on RCP 4.5, which is an intermediate scenario. That's assuming that we really start getting our together soon and we can um, you know end emissions by 2050. Um, and then after that, maybe use carbon sequestration technology and start pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and so if we're able to do that, we can maybe keep global temperature rise to like three degrees. Um, but we're not on that track. We're on the RCP, RCP 8.5 track right now, which is the high scenario. Um, and that's kind of business as usual. And if we go back to the graph showing you know, f carbon emissions that are ramping up and up and up. That's, that's the track we're on currently with 8.5. Um, and if we keep doing that, if we don't get carbon under control till like 2100, um, we can look to see a, you know, a global climate with a, you know, temperature rise of, you know, five degrees um, centigrade. So, and that's, that's not a planet that we would recognize. So we're really, we, that's, you know, that's the worst case scenario at this point if uh, we keep on that track. And just, so some of the things we talk about, certainly in, as a coastal community, um, sea level rise is, is something that we think about a lot, and it's kind of the, you know, because, you know, we see the ocean every day. Um, so how much is it going to go up? We, you know, we, we, and it's, it's kind of up to us. If we look at this chart, um, you can see we're kind of at the inflection point where the lines start to diverge. Um, so we can choose uh, how high, you know, we, the, the global we, um, can make some decisions about how how we react, and if we stay on the track we're on now, we can see the bright red line that goes up to the two and a half meters of sea level rise by 2100, um, and we can imagine what that would look like. And I got, I got some maps I can show you what it might look like if that happens, um, or we can take some action and keep and keep um, the uh, the sea level rise less. So we did a project a couple years ago called um, Bayside Adapts, and we had um, some scientists look at all the recent data, uh, the most current data available in terms of what we might expect for sea level rise. Um, we mapped it onto, um, you know, onto Portland. We used all of our existing map, map data. And so they're telling us that we should commit to manage um, almost two feet of sea level rise by 2050. Um, but, we should, and, but we should also uh, commit to manage over four feet by 2100. And that's, again, that's the intermediate scenario. That assumes that we kind of get our act together in the not too distant future and reduce emissions. But um, again, if we stay on that, you know, the business as usual tra trajectory, um, we should prepare to manage almost four feet of sea level rise by 2050 and over 11 by, um, by 2100. So again, I mentioned if we don't change our course, we're gonna have a, a place that we don't recognize and uh, Portland, with you know, 11 feet of sea level rise is gonna be a different place. In fact, it's, if we look at the dark blue, um, 
that's the, you know, that's the 10 to 11 feet of sea level rise. And we can see that Bayside is no longer, it's underwater. And all the things we like to go visit on Commercial Street are also underwater. So that's a, you know, that's a different city than we currently have now. In fact, it's a city that the uh, people who, the Europeans who came to, uh, to, Port, you know, to Falmouth Neck back in the 1600s would have recognized because all the area that, um, that we see that covered in the blue um, is fill. It was filled in after starting, you know, in the colonial times on Commercial Street and after the Great Fire of 1866 in the Bayside area. Um, so that's all been filled out and developed. Again, if we don't um, make some changes, uh, the sea will reclaim what it had before. Um, so Bayside, here's, here's a picture of uh, Bayside uh, back in 2015. Um, we had a, a rain event. We had um, almost six inches of rain in just a few hours, and it happened to fall at high tide. Um, and so you probably know that um, in, in the Bayside area, down near Whole Foods and down by U-Haul, even on a bright sunny day, um, if we have an astronomical high tide, there's standing water. Um, so what happens is sea, the sea level, you know, seas come up um, into the back cove and they come up the pipes and they, and they spill out onto the street. So if we happen to have a rainfall, particularly a uh, very heavy rainfall, all the water has nowhere to go. So um, it, it kind of ponds up and in this particular case we had cars floating down Franklin Street and you know, no one could get around very much. But um, that's something we expect to see more of as time goes on is more heavy intense downpours. So in addition to sea level rise, we have to worry about more rain events that come with dramatic rain all at once. And so, you know, and that wasn't a one-off case. Um, well, I mentioned that we have it all the time. So here's, a, I love our police department, their, their Twitter account. So we have to barricade, right now, like I mentioned, on sunny days we'll have, um, we'll have flooding. So we can look at our tide chart and we know which days are going to have a, have flooding, so the public works department has to go out and put barricades, and people get frustrated. So our police have been a have a humorous approach to remind people that uh, they should obey the barricades. Um, but I mentioned that the heavy downpours are not a one-off thing. Um, just the year prior to the to the flooding in the Bayside, we had another you know heavy rainstorm, and we had six inches of rain that fell um, just overnight and everyone woke up in the morning and found that High Street had washed away um, because water was you know, just coming down the hill so intensely that it, it washed it away. So all of the infrastructure that we have to manage water around the city is, is vulnerable to being overcharged and, and to um, just not being up to the task of handling the amount of, of heavy rain that we, we can expect in the future. And another thing, this is one of my least favorite things, is heat. I'm a Maine person. I grew up in Maine, I, and I like cooler weather. So um, increasingly hot days is not something that I'm looking forward to. Um, but as you probably know, last July was the hottest month in the history of the Earth, um, not just in Maine, but, but around the world. Um, and it's, you know, it's mentioned it's all around the world. We can see um, in Europe, and, you know, Europe, Asia, Africa, India, Pakistan, and particularly the Arctic are, are dramatically warmer than they were. This is a map from 2018, um, so the following year, 2019, was even worse. Um, but you kind of note if you look where, you know, up in the northeast U.S., there's, we're under one of the red spots. So the northeast is one of the rapidly warming parts of the planet. Um, we've seen temperature, our average annual temperature in Maine has risen over three degrees in the past 100 years. And pretty much on any of the scenarios, uh, the 2.6 or the 8.5, we're expecting Maine to, the temperature to increase another three degrees by 2050. That's kind of built into the cake. So even if we stop carbon emissions today, we'll probably still see three degrees of temperature increase by 2050. So um, that's, that'll certainly change the climate here in, in Portland. And as the years, as the decades go by, we're anticipating that we'll see our our climate here be more what you might see currently in like northern Alabama. So hot, humid, um, with kind of sweltering days. Um, so while other parts of the world are seeing, you know, hot daily highs of like 130 degrees in the Middle East or in Pakistan, we're fortunate we won't be seeing heat that intense, but we can expect um, by 2050 we'll see 14 or more days um, 
that are over 90 degrees, many of them over 95 degrees. Um, and by 2100, we could see the whole summer would be over 90 degrees. So ugh, not looking forward to that. So, um, But heat, you know, heat, heat's not just in a nuisance. It's actually something that's really dangerous for a lot of people, particularly people with respiratory illnesses, um, the elderly, elderly people, people who are on some, some sort of medications or also make them vulnerable to heat. Um, so heat can actually um, be, you know, can cause you know, a lot of heat-related deaths. People who work on the outside um, have a challenging time. Um, in fact, there's you know, parts of the world now in India, Pakistan, parts of the Middle East, in the daytime, people you know, in the summer, like when it's 130 degrees, you literally can't go outside and work because you just, your body can't take that. So fortunately, we are not looking for that particularly, but you can see that um, around the country, even in the Northeast, um, we can expect to see more um, heat-related illnesses and deaths. Um, it has been you know, around the world. Last year, you know, during July in, in France, during the heat wave, literally hundreds of people you know, in Western developed country with resources, it's still, you know, people still, people die from heat-related, even in developed countries. So, um, I mean, people who do have the resources. So if you're in a country that doesn't have you know, the infrastructure, or if you're in a state like Maine that is not used to heat, we don't have, most of our homes are old, a lot of people don't have air conditioning, um, so that heat can be an issue. But one of the things we need to can be concerned about with heat, too, are elderly people are particularly vulnerable. So, and, and also people who are isolated. So elderly people who, with, who are isolated are at particular risk to, um, to heat-related illnesses. And in a state like Maine, um, where it's rural, um, many seniors live you know, miles and miles from neighbors. And so that's a concern that um, I think hopefully the people at the state level are starting to think about how do we deal with heat illnesses in rural parts of the state. Um, so really, climate change and as it, how it affects us is really going to be a public health issue as much as anything. Um, we, you know, we deal, think a lot about infrastructure and you know, how do we keep the sea from rising, but how do we, you know, how do we protect people? How, you know, because the work we're doing in, you know, becoming more climate resilient and, you know, to make Portland a sustainable community isn't about, you know, roads and, and bridges and seawalls. Um, those are all things that benefit people. So that's how, we, that's how we're thinking about climate change is, is, a, is a, human, a human people issue, community issue. So I was, um, you know, this summer I was asked to speak at the American uh, Maine Public Health Association um, conference, um, which I was really pleased that the health, you know, the health community was reaching out because they, t they take it really seriously. So as I was um, kind of doing some work around it, I realized how much good work the public health people are doing nationally. So they're going to be great allies, and our public health department here in Portland is really excited to be part of uh, climate action planning. Um, because we're going to see a lot more problematic things. For instance, uh, vector-borne diseases, so um, ticks. Um, when I was a kid and growing up in, in central Maine, we didn't have ticks. We didn't have, you know, there was no Lyme disease. No one was concerned about those things. There, you know, really, there weren't any cases of Lyme disease in, in Maine until the late 80s. Um, and then people started to be aware of it. By, but by, you know, by 2014, um, it's very, it was very prevalent. And certainly you know, now, you know, you have to be very concerned about ticks. And island communities, our island communities um, are particularly vulnerable. There's ticks all over the islands. And so, you know, there's been more and more cases of Lyme disease in Portland um, and, and throughout Maine. So that's a concern. And ticks, unfortunately, aren't just, they don't just carry Lyme anymore. So we have to be concerned about a variety of different tick-borne illnesses. Um, so that's going to be, continue to be a, uh, a problem for us. And um, We've been fortunate in the Northeast not to have had problems with mosquito-borne illnesses, but again, with rising temperatures, more humidity, uh, standing water from the heavy rainfalls that we can expect becomes prime, uh, prime mosquito breeding grounds. And so, um, you know, we've you know, probably in the past we've heard a little bit about, you know, West Nile virus or Zika or um, Eastern equine encephalitis. Um, those are things that we can probably anticipate to become more of a problem. And you know, even some you know, more exotic diseases could be a possibility, um, but these ones certainly are the ones that we're most concerned about. Um, and air quality, air quality certainly has been a big topic um, in the Portland and South Portland area with the, with the fuel tanks, but um, 
but you know, again, as, it, as the climate warms, um, we're going to see more issues with uh, like pollen. I don't know if people have allergies, I do. And so um, Maine actually is going to be an epicenter as, as the climate warms and we'll have more and more um, plants and tree species that issue, that put out a lot of pollen. So people with allergies don't have much to look forward there. Um, but also um, you know, mold, um, again, with more humidity, we can anticipate more mold, which is an air quality concern. But also um, on hot, humid days, um, you often hear about bad air quality days with ground level ozone. So that's something that's a problem too, with, again, with, with, um, with high temperatures and, um, you know, and ground level ozone. So, so more days when you have to be careful when you're outside exercising or if you have respiratory problems to be concerned about. So we're also worried about that. But one thing that um, kind of been on our mind a great deal recently are climate refugees. And if you look um, around, the, we mentioned that the heat, there's heat all around the world and different places are um, experiencing a lot of difficulties. Um, so in other parts of the world, the, the climate impacts have been more significant certainly than they have been here in, in Maine. Um, so if we see in the news, we get visitors, you know, we're getting people coming to Portland from different parts of the world and a lot of the more recent um, refugees who have come to Portland are from Central Africa, and if you look at the map of Africa, it's a bright red spot um, in the middle of that continent. It's you know experiencing some of the most dramatic impacts of climate change to date. So um, it's getting hotter, um, serious problems with heavy rainfalls. Um, pop there's a rising population, and natural resources are really being degraded. So people are having a, a, a really hard time and. You know, Congo, which is in the middle, DR, the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo is a, you know, large, they have a very large population. It's, you know, I think it's like 60 million people who live in Congo, quite a few people. Um, and the whole region is just experiencing some challenges. But also, um, another place that's been really racked by climate impacts is Central America, um, in Honduras and El Salvador. So they've been experiencing extreme hurricanes, extreme weather, wind, but also when, when they aren't being hit by those bad storms, um, drought has been a serious problem. So people, subsistence farmers and people trying to grow coffee or other crops have had experienced crop failures. So it's been a real challenge. We find on the southern border, certainly um, people are trying to flee Central America and, um, and we're having certainly the crisis at the border and the conflict around immigration that's certainly fueled um, by climate change. Um, just some, some numbers. Um, so in sub-Saharan Africa, which is, you know, includes uh, Central Africa, um, by 2050, we're looking at uh, 86 million refugees, the World, ba the World Bank predicts. Um, South Asia, so India, Pakistan, 40 million refugees by 2050. And Latin America, so Central America, a lot of people leaving. Central America, and that doesn't even count Southeast Asia, um, which has millions of people living in coastal cities uh, that are extremely vulnerable to climate change. So people are going to be moving as sea level rises and storms becoming more intense and heat becomes more of a problem. People are going to be moving around a great deal. So just the numbers you know, from Africa, Asia, South Asia, and Latin America, basically that's 143 million people that the World Bank expects to be um, Refugees. That's the population of Russia. So if you can imagine everyone in Russia having to go somewhere else, that's kind of the scale of the problem that the World Bank is anticipating. Um, and just a little bit of context about um, Central Africa. So um, there's a climate activist in Uganda, uh, Leah Numagorwa. Um, so she posted this on Twitter today. Um, she mentioned that they're hit by heavy rainfalls every few days. Um, she had, you know, this was a landslide near, near her home um, yesterday. Um, it rained for um, five hours and they had flash flooding and, and you know, the video is amazing with the impact. So the scale of what's happening in, in some of the, you know, these countries that are being impacted, is, it's mind boggling. And so here's a picture of Portland uh, from this summer. As you recall, we had um, about 350 refugees um, who came and we and they lived in the expo over the summertime while you know, we were trying to uh, find housing for people. And it was very impressive and we were um, really pleased that the community uh, came together to support um, the, the folks who came to the expo and to support uh, city staff um, by volunteering and um, providing financial assistance. Um, 
it's a, it was really great that the community came together to assist um, the refugees, and we were able to find homes for, for everybody in time for the Red Cross to uh, begin their season. Um, but, you know, and it's great that we were able to do so, you know, to take care of that issue, but it really did tax um, the city's um, abilities to handle that. So it was all hands on deck. Our social services department was, you know, it was really difficult. All the different departments came together. Um, and the community donated almost a million dollars um, to help support the effort. So, um, but that was 350 people who came. Um, if we had 3,500 or 35,000, it would have, you know, the scale of the problem would have been that much worse. So, as we move forward and we think about the impacts that we see globally, and Portland, you know, Portland being a very nice place to live with a, you know, pretty accommodating climate. Um, I think we should anticipate more people coming here and, and as we plan for you know, a climate future, we need to make sure we think about that. Um, you know, certainly we already talk about you know, affordable housing issues, but um, unless we take, you know, put some thought into this, it could certainly be, be worse, a worse problem than it is now. Um, and so, like I mentioned earlier, so climate change has been something that the city has been thinking about for some time. Um, so in 2007, um, the current ma the mayor at the time put together a um, task force um, called the Mayor's Sustainable Portland Re um, Task Force. And they mentioned that uh, climate change may be the greatest challenge to the city since the rebuilding after the Great Fire. So. Um, was, in some ways, that's kind of an, a climate emergency declaration back in 2007. Because when you pull the Great Fire card, you know that's that's serious. That's you know in 1866, a significant part of the city uh, was destroyed by fire. So, and that's kind of where we are now. We, I think that's the that's the t the way we need to think about this problem moving forward. Is is um, you know we're going to have challenges with you know sea level rise and heat and and you know more folks coming to the to the area. So. What are we going to do? How do we address these problems? Um, and and how do we try to you know make make a positive outcome um, as we move into the future? Because you know the reason that we all live here in Portland is because the quality of life is amazing. It's a tremendous place to live. We have you know the Casco Bay and the mountains are a short ways away, and and just it's a great place to be. So we, that's something as we think about you know planning for the for the future. That's that's what we want to keep. How do we keep this quality of life? things that make Portland and South Portland great um, as, we, as we address some really serious issues that we're going to have to face. To, uh, to face. So we decided uh, to collaborate with our colleagues in South Portland. And as far as we know, we're the only two cities that are developing a joint climate action plan. So we're going to have one plan for both cities because we realize that um, you know, we could have the best climate action plan anywhere and they could have the best climate action plan. But if they're not talking to each other, if they're not um, you know, reference each other and the actions we don't take build, don't build on what South Portland does and vice versa. It's, it's not going to be effective. We share too many, we, you know, we share infrastructure and our, you know, the people who live in Portland, you know, might work in South Portland and or go to restaurants there and, and vice versa. So we're really connected. Um, there's, you know, we're two separate cities, but we're really, we're really dependent on each other. Um, so we're coming to work together um, and our goal is to, um, again, that Portland and South Portland work to be inclusive, vibrant communities that provide opportunities for residents and businesses to thrive in a changing climate. So that's that's the whole that's our mission with One Climate Future is how do we maintain um, what makes Portland and South Portland great um, in the face of the changing climate. Um, so we've been thinking about what, how do we um, how do we take some actions to um, kind of um, you know prevent some of the worst outcomes. How do we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the, in the short term? So this is a wedge analysis that we developed to um, think about what sectors do we need to work on to, um, to achieve 80% carbon reduction by 2050. So you can see that um, it takes, it's, takes everyone in the community to do this. So the building sector is the blue part on the top. That's uh, you know, new buildings and, old, and existing buildings, city buildings. There's a tiny little line in there that you can barely see, our city operations. So the city government can't do this ourselves. We're just a tiny fraction of the wedge. So um, we, need all, you know, we need lots of interventions. Um, we can thank Governor Mills for the big red stripe in the middle. 
Um, that's the 100% renewable portfolio standard. So Governor Mills signed a bill uh, last session that requires all the electricity in our, in our main grid to be generated by renewable energy by 2050 and 80% renewable by 2030. So that's, that makes Maine a real leader on climate, a real leader on energy policy in the whole country. So that was a tremendous, uh, a tremendous achievement. And uh, solar is certainly going to pay, play a big part in the future. The bright yellow um, is local solar. Um, and so the governor also signed a number of bills that are going to really improve uh, solar and help, uh, help cities around the, country, around the state do a lot better with solar. In fact, right now the city has an RFP out for about up to 75% of our entire uh, city's electrical load to be generated by solar power. So we're really excited about that. And so about, that would be about 24,000 megawatt hours of electricity. So we're hoping to get some really great proposals to review so we can make some real progress towards um, enter, to being a solar powered city. Again, so there's four plan elements that we're going to work on to achieve um, our climate goals. So again, I mentioned 60% of our emissions in, in the greater Portland area are from buildings. So we're gonna work really hard uh, to make sure we use energy efficiently um, and transition to renewable uh, energy. Um, we also th need to think really hard about land use um, because um, you know, if we can have a, you know, a denser, a denser um, city can generate, you know, reduces less, it produces less carbon to have a denser city. People don't have to uh, travel around as much. So the other key area, the other 30% um, of emissions we wanna really get at is from uh, transportation. So. Um, we need to get people to take the bus, ride, the bike, ride their bikes, um, walk to work, and that's a lot easier to do in a, in a denser development pattern. Um, so part of our goal is like by, to, in that part of that wedge analysis, we need to get 50% of the people to take alternative forms of tr transportation other than cars by 2050. So we call it a 50% mode share. So, there's things we need to do to um, make it more convenient for people to ride the bus. We need you know, more, more frequent service um, so people can rely that the bus will come when they, need, when they need to catch it and not have to wait out in the rain for a long time. So that's, those are some areas gonna, we're gonna be working really hard on. Um, waste reduction is also a really key area. Um, if you look back on the little pile of where carbon emissions from Portland comes from, waste is actually, you know, contributes very little to our local greenhouse gas emissions, but it contributes significantly to emissions around the world. So if you think about, you know, where, you know, what, what the things that we like, recycle or to throw in the trash here in Portland um, is 3% of our emissions, but um, all the packaging, the manufacturing, the transportation, the mining of natural resources are very, very carbon intense. So we're just on the very tail end of the emissions pipe, so to speak, of, so, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not, the local, so local carbon emissions aren't really affected by our, by our solid waste, but it makes a huge impact um, on, the, on the global scale. So that's an important step. And climate resilience too. Certainly we mentioned that sea level rise is going to be you know, a significant problem. So we need to make sure that um, we're thinking about how do we develop the city in ways that are resilient um, to, to increasing flood water. So do we, right now we're working on um, a, what we're calling a climate resilience overlay zone. So a new construction that would be um, built in areas that might be susceptible to sea level rise in the future would have to be built to withstand um, being flooded on a regular basis. So with you know, concrete floor, maybe parking or retail that could be moved if there's going to be a large storm event with, um, then you could put the, um, infra the vital infrastructure, the mechanicals higher so they can't be you know, damaged by water. Um, so we're thinking about how, what's the best way to um, make that happen. Is it incentives or is it strict regulation? So working that through, we've had a couple conversations with the planning board, but that's going to be a pretty big topic. Because right now, our planning department really doesn't have a lot of really good tools to require um, resilient buildings. So that's going to be a really important step moving forward. But um, resilience isn't just infrastructure. It's not just buildings. and and seawalls. It's really how do we develop community resilience? So how do we have an economy um, that can withstand shocks and disruptions? So we need strong local businesses we need, and we need strong community connections. So one of the things that's great about Maine is people are friendly and, and so how do we make sure that we keep that kind of close-knit 
uh, feeling and how do we um, you know, keep people um, engaged with each other and caring about their neighbors and being involved in um, neighborhood organizations and um, just being a strong part of the community. Those are so that, you know, that seems like a soft element, but really communities that have those connections are able to withstand um, shocks and, you know, whether it be a, a storm or, or some other disaster much more effectively than people who don't have those, those associations. So that's really an important part of the plan. And public engagement um, is, you know, as, as part of our plan, um, we're really concerned about public engagement, so that's why we do talks like this. Um, so we want people to, you know, to learn some of the facts that we have. We also want people to talk to, um, talk to your friends and neighbors and colleagues about um, sea level rise and climate change and how it might affect the things that you're interested in. Um, and so we've been doing some surveys as part of our outreach program. And um, one thing that I was really excited to see is that um, almost 80% of people in Portland are very concerned about climate change. So that's, we're off to a good start there. Uh, but I was even more excited to see that almost 70% of people in Portland who took the survey think that climate change will affect them personally. Because nationally, a lot of people are, have a feeling that climate change will be a problem for somebody, but not for them. So it's really a, it's, you know, it's good to see that people in Portland and South Portland are, are aware that climate change is you know, having impact on us already, and it will have a more you know have more impact uh, moving forward. So that, we're off to a good start, and so I think um, you know we appreciate the support we're getting, and I think because the public realizes that it's uh, that we're having a problem with climate change, mm -hmm. and so again we we mentioned that we've had a, you know, we have a lot of people in, in the Portland area now who have come from other countries, so we wanted to make sure that our program is accessible to everybody, so we've translated our materials into uh, several languages other than English, so we have um, Portuguese and Spanish, uh, French and Arabic. Um, and so we've had some great um, community volunteers um, who are members of, those, of the different communities who speak uh, some of these languages who have been great volunteers and have been taking our materials um, back to their friends and neighbors. And so we've, we've actually been able to get good feedback from, you know, from some people who aren't, who, whose English isn't their first language. So um, that's been really great. Um, this summer we had a street team of young people who spent, they went, you know, they spent time in the parks and they went to community events and uh, talked to members of the community about climate change, passed out some of our flyers, got people to take surveys. Um, this this um, fall we have one, one um, street team member who's doing some of the same things. She spent some time riding um, the metro um, a couple weeks ago, uh, t speaking to people who are riding the bus. Again, are, we're really trying to get out in, into speaking to people, not to just the people who come to meetings or to, to, uh, to lectures, but you know, people who are going about their daily lives and maybe don't have time to come to, to other things. So we just want to get feedback from everybody. Social media has been a really good platform for, um, for both Portland and South Portland. So certainly invite you to uh, follow Sustainable Portland, Maine on Instagram. Um, we try to keep people up to date with what we're doing and, and some tips about uh, sustainability on our Instagram feed. Um, and we've been really um, happy to go to a lot of different special events. Um, on the left, we, uh, we were at Parking Day this summer, so we spent um, a whole day um, out next to Tommy's Park um, and just interacting with all the people coming out, um, sharing information about um, One Climate Future. And um, both, uh, our, both our offices got a chance to um, do a uh, radio program with the Portland Radio Group. So. We um, talked about One Climate Future, and, and, and so they broadcast um, the interview on all of the Portland uh, radio group stations, so country music fans and, and rock fans and, and everything in between had a chance to hear the, hear the, uh, the interview, which was great. And I'm actually I was surprised. I was somewhere a few days ago and ran into someone who um, recognized my name and said, oh, I heard you on WPOR. So country music fans were able to hear. Um, hear our talk as well. Um, one thing that I think is really important about our outreach program particularly is that we've really been trying to make it be decentralized as much as possible. Um, so we, on our website, oneclimatefuture.org, um, we, we have a, a meeting in a box kit. So anybody can do a One Climate Future talk. So you can download some, some slides and some handouts. Um, and then some information, and, and you can do a One Climate Future talk with your, at work or 
at um, your church or, any, or just with your neighbors and family. Um, and so that's been pretty successful. We've had on quite a number of people doing those. And actually we've had um, community volunteers who have taken, taken it on the road for us. So we had um, um, this a few weeks ago in October, we had um, at Red Bank Village in South Portland, one of the residents there organized um, two different uh, meetings for all the residents in Red Bank. Um, and the, the, uh, owners, the ownership of the property was really helpful in, in helping her organize uh, the meeting. And so she had one in the morning and one at night to try to accommodate as many people as she could. Um, we had, um, um, we've had one Climate Future talks at yoga studios and um, community groups and neighborhood association meetings. So it's really great. We're, in, you know, we're continuing to encourage people to get involved and, and do uh, one Climate Future meetings. And just a quick note on our timeline. So we started uh, the One Climate Future program back. Um, we hired our consulting team um, in January. We really started to launch it um, in March, uh, in May. We've been doing a lot of research. We you know, did our climate hazard assessment and we did our greenhouse gas inventory. Uh, we've been out talking to the public. Um, and right, and so we're like the, kind of the, ooh, kind of the um, rubber will hit the road, I think, after January. So we've gotten, We've gotten our adaptation strat uh, climate hazard report done, and we're starting to put together um, what are the strategies we want to implement. So our third survey will be coming out very soon, and that's going to be really important because we're trying to get feedback about what measures the city should be taking um, to make the community more resilient in the face of climate change. So I certainly encourage everyone to stay tuned to the oneclimatefuture.org website or follow us on Instagram so you can be kept up to speed about when that survey comes out because we really, really want to get a lot of feedback um, about the, the actions that people think that Portland should take uh, for climate change. And then our final report will be due to the City Council um, in June of uh, 2020. Um, and then the work will really begin. We'll have to uh, implement the plan. So again, after, with the declaration of climate emergency, we're going to try to do whatever we can to front load um, actions to reduce uh, carbon emissions in the 2030 timeline. So that's going to be an aggressive, uh, aggressive uh, goal to achieve. Um, but we're really excited to be doing this work. And I mentioned that you know I've been working with the city for over 20 years doing climate work, but in this in the last few years, it's just really exciting to be part of this. It's you know we're at an inflection point, I think, um, globally, particularly on this issue. And it's just um, I feel really gratified to be in a position to uh, be engaged in this work. And um, I hope you will be too. So thanks. Happy to take questions. Yes. Um, I'm curious how you perceive the planning department in terms of being receptive to really creating requirements for new buildings and even existing buildings. I as an architect, and I, yeah. right, I, I see every new project as an opportunity to really push the kind of agenda you're talking about, but I don't see it mm -hmm. in any way being enforceable yet. And you know, just as a as an example, uh, the whole large development which is happening right down the street, which actually starts at Commercial Street and works its way up to Spring Street. I've seen, you know, I've seen the plans. <coughs> I can't say that I'm intimately familiar with them. But from what I can see in those, you know, that's a large development for this city. That's a very substantial area. I don't know if the flood mapping that you did actually includes some of that, you know, commercial street end of the property, but, you know, there's nothing in it that's pushing the envelope, as far as I can tell, in terms of water catchment, you know, green roofs, energy generation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just, you know, it's a frustration that the, I don't, I don't see that the, that the city yet is making the building code kind of demand high performance. So I'm curious where yeah. you guys are going with it all. Yeah, thanks for that question. And the question roughly is um, what are the, you know, What's the planning, how is the planning department thinking about um, climate change and requirements around higher performing buildings and addressing you know, vulnerabilities to flooding and sea level rise? So that's a great question. So I mentioned that we're starting to work on um, a climate resilience overlay. Um, because up to now, the, you know, the, the planning department really hasn't had tools in the toolbox to, in, to enforce that. 
um, to enforce you know, the high, you know, anything stronger than the main building code. Um, so that's what we're working on now. So we were active um, working at, at the state legislature to try to get uh, the state to adopt um, a higher, you know, the 2015 energy code um, to adopt, to allow the city to adopt a stretch energy code. Um, and so we were successful on that. So the, so the energy, the stretch energy code will be developed um, with, the, with the main code board um, over the next several months. So we'll be actively engaged in that. But we'll continue to talk about this climate resilience overlay and how do we, how do we have either requirements or incentives to, um, to have those you know, more resilient structures in areas that are susceptible. So when some of the new construction you mentioned was in the permitting process, they, you know, the, the planning department just didn't have the tools in their toolbox to require those types of performances. But those, those we're working on developing them now. So. What efforts are being done to incentivize the EVs and hybrids? Um, so, um, having people transition away from fossil fuel vehicles certainly is going to be really a key. Um, so we have several um, EV charging stations currently, um, but over the next several months we'll be installing 14 new charging stations. Um, so there'll be five locations with multiple chargers, so there'll be um, Batco parking lot will have them, um, the little parking lot on Spring and High Street by Little Tap House, that's going to have some, uh, Payson Park is getting some. The jet port short-term parking is going to get some. Actually, currently installing a, a bank of charge level one charges in the long-term parking at the jet port. Um, so we'll have five new locations um, by, you know, I'm not sure if we'll be able to get them built during the winter, but by springtime, we should have them all online. So, and in terms of EVs, um, the, there's, you know, in, incentives at the state level through Efficiency Main um, for, um, for EVs right now, um, and certainly the tax credit is still current for um, EVs, so you can get a federal tax credit. For, if you um, purchase a new one, that's true, but if you purchase a used vehicle. Yeah, no, and used ones uh, are the way to go, certainly. Even a even an old Nissan Leaf, first gen with you know 80 miles of range is still great for an around town car, just driving around the Portland area if you're commuting. So, and a lot of times you can get those for relatively cheap, um, so, um, but yeah, we, we can. Those are you know those certainly an area we'll we'll be doing a lot more is trying to get the word out and putting you know trying to. I'm not, I'm not sure the city will have funds to provide incentives for vehicles, but certainly you know information and resources. Mm -hmm. and, and, what about like incentives on registration or something like that? Yeah, I mean that's something you know one of the areas we're going to have to intervene um, is in policy. We can't we can't do everything ourselves, so. Um, I think we are fortunate that we have um, a governor and a legislature that's supportive of climate action right now. Um, certainly, Governor Mills is positioning herself as a real champion amongst governors. Um, so, some of those incentives and you know discounts on registration are really state level policies that we need to implement. So, um, I think we would be receptive to uh, you know to advocate for them. Certainly, um, I just started to read. Um, few articles on the value of high quality, very highly organic soil mm -hmm. in sequestering carbon. Yeah. And I'm wondering if a strategy around creating more open space that allows for more soil versus building a lot of buildings mm -hmm. um, might not be a good strategy. Yeah, no, I think um, carbon sequestration through planting is going to be really important. So Portland, we're the forest city, so we do have, you know, we have a we have a lot of forest land inside the city, you know, Baxter Woods and all the land in the Four, in the four River Sanctuary and along um, Presumpscot River. Um, we have 1,400 acres of open space in the city, and so a lot of, most of it's managed um, pretty loosely, so it's not, not maintained intensively, so um, that sequesters carbon. So I think one of the things we want to do kind of is think about how much carbon are, are the open spaces sequestering. Um, but we all certainly need to build, you know, planting, planting more trees is um, something we want to do as well. So working with our harbor, the city parks. My understanding, though, is that the soil really needs to be ameliorated in order to, um, to do its job. Yeah, and it's certainly, you know, we, we're, we're limited. You know, agriculture, I think, on a larger scale um, can, be really you know, can be really important. You know, we don't have a lot of agricultural land here in, in Portland, per se. Um, but we do have a pretty healthy, you know, ur you know, urban farming scene. The community garden program is 
pretty robust. Um, and we have the, um, the Mount Joy Orchard, if you haven't had a chance to visit that, it's on uh, Munjoy Hill, um, which is right below, um, right below the East End School. Um, really great volunteer run uh, community orchard that's actually starting to have some fruit on the trees, which is great. Really so. I truly appreciate all the work you're doing right now, and it's great. And of course, you can't look back and say we should have started this in 1987 because you know when we should have. Yeah. So we are where we are, and we can move forward. That said, I'm just curious about your um, perspective on all the building that's happening now and in the last couple of years on Commercial Street mm -hmm. in a marginal way. Um, it's great that we're coming up with some new standards, hopefully, that will be implemented and the planning board will be able to use, but sometimes it strikes me as the cat's already out of the bag. Are we a little late, or is there going to be all kinds of, am I not, you know, where's, where's the new space for any new buildings? I mean, it's all being built up right now. So how, how is this going to, maybe we can retrofit, right. haven't we lost a lot in the last five years or so by not capturing these new buildings on commercial street and marginal way that are all going to be flooded out by 2050? Yeah, I mean, well, so, you know, in some ways, you know, we, we can't go undo that. Um, so in the future, um, I think there'll be some need to make those buildings be more energy efficient. Um, again, we, you know, we don't currently have the tools to retroactively require people to, uh, to um, increase the efficiency of their buildings. So, well, again, they're, they're already built, so. And, um, and so, but you know, so like I said, we're working on tools, uh, the resilience overlay zone, um, and so that's you know that we have to we have to go forward from where we are, um, and will we have to talk to the owners of those buildings to get them up to you know be more energy efficient? Yes, we're going to have to if we want to achieve the climate goals we have. We need all of the buildings in Portland to be more efficient. So. And you had your hand up first, yeah. No, you were here in the front row. Um, you all have your hands more than full with being here in Portland and South Portland. Uh, those of us who live in communities that you might say are the bedrooms of communities in Portland, and might work in Portland or come to Portland a lot, uh, you know, we're kind of, just speaks to your point, maybe we might be kind of off-setting or doing in and sort of driving. You've seen perhaps the river of traffic going yeah. out to my tie mm -hmm. at night and in the morning and it gets harder and harder to find a town or leave town. Down route one, yeah. the same thing, I'm sure some of the other um, roadways. Do you all tie in at all with any other groups that are trying to forward things in those areas um, in any way or can you just recommend another? We'd um, so, in terms of regional collaboration, we do uh, collaborate with other with other groups. So, there's the Greater Portland Council of Governments, um, which is you know they're all the regional all the towns in the Portland, Greater Portland area are members, and that's they do regional transportation planning, and um, the Greater Portland Metro system, and so right now GP Cog and Metro are working on a regional transit plan. And there's really a lot of great ideas to you know, make transit more effective for people who don't live in Portland. And Metro has actually had a, lot, has had a lot of success. So the Breeze service that runs from Portland to Brunswick has been really well received. In fact, um, Yarmouth has chosen to become a, a member of, of Metro um, because they're finding their residents are uh, really benefiting from the service. Um, now, of course, we have the Husky Line going from Portland to Gorham uh, in partnership with the University of Southern Maine. Um, and I know Metro, talking, if you talk to Greg Jordan, who's the director of Metro, he has a vision of having like, a bus rapid transit system that would run from like Bitterford to, to Brunswick so people could, could you know, get on buses that were you know, moving very quickly with few stops to get, so they could really rely on that to get to work. So that's kind of in the imagination stage at this point. Um, but that's the type of action we need to take, certainly, is getting people, f providing transit that's really convenient, uh, f that people can make it part of their lives without um, you know, having struggles. So. And there was a question way back there. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, so first of all, thanks for being here. This is really fascinating. And I'm really excited to hear about the work you guys are doing. Um, I'm curious about the Portland Metro Transit Authority. Is there any way you guys can uh, how like youth organizing has impacted you so far, and I'm wondering, um, like, what kind of what kind of role do you see for uh, 
community organizing in general, including youth organizing, but also other groups that exist. I'm thinking of, I know the Citizens Climate, climate Lobby is sort of a one issue campaign, uh, but also 350, and I'm wondering if you see possible collaboration or um, how, how we might all work together. Yeah, that's a great question. So, and, you know, it's how do we continue to have youth involvement, and I would say youth leadership um, on climate, um, because some of us are getting older, and you know, by 2100, I'm not expecting to be around. And um, but um, you know, but youth have um, a large stake in the future, and a lot of energy. I think you know, keeping the pressure, not so much the pressure, but keeping climate action um, live in people's minds, uh, keeping it a uh, discussion that happens at the city council uh, on a regular basis, um, you know, having conversations with uh, everybody to, to we're aware of the scale of, the, of what we're trying to do here, um, talking to, you know, your business, you know, local businesses, you know, having people, um, you know, adopt um, energy policies and energy practices and packaging process, you know, um, policies that reduce waste. Um, and then just, you know, staying engaged with, you know, certainly happy to talk to, to any, any leaders, any youth leaders about how to be involved and what role, what role do, you, do youth feel like they should play? Um, I think that's, you know, what, 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 is, what do youth want to do and how do youth want to be involved? I think that's an important Important. I want to listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. I was um, so as cities like ours are thinking about mitigation and reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Do you know are there also ways that we can be thinking about making ourselves less hospitable to the fossil fuel industry? Like, I'm thinking of global partners. I've been following the emissions stories in the newspaper. I know they're like a Fortune 500 company. Um, you know, pretty much all their assets are predicated on continued extraction of fossil fuels, and I wonder, like, how much is our tax base reliant on that, and are we thinking about that kind of stuff? Yeah, um, that's a great, you know, it's a great question. So, one of the things in the um, in the climate emergency de emergency declaration was no new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so now that, that's interesting to think about. Um, in Portland, per se, um, our tax, we don't have a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure in Portland, but South Portland does. Um, so the, you know, the oil tanks, oil storage tanks, um, you know, what's the future? If we move, you know, our goal is to become carbon neutral, to, to stop using fossil fuels in, uh, in Portland, South Portland, ultimately in the state. So what is the future of those, of those fuel tanks? I mean, unless, unless the companies that own them are able to think about how to be involved in the energy economy without fossil fuels, there maybe is not a place for them. Um, but you know, certainly I think Portland would, you know, we have a, a port, we have port infrastructure here. Um, I would like to see Portland position itself to be a leader in offshore wind and renewable energy. So maybe we can continue to be an energy port, but not a fossil fuel port. Um, I know talking to some like my, my other colleagues, that's a goal that other city staff share as well. So. And we, you know, we have, you know, I'm skipped now with, um, you know, transportation of goods and service, you know, our goods produced in the region can be transported to uh, Europe um, through cargo containers. So how do we develop, how do we develop that sort of, that sort of trade, but move away from the fossil fuel trade? That's in, again, if we're going to be serious about achieving our climate goals and the state's going to be serious about achieving its climate goals, you know, those, those facilities need to transition. <laughs> Um, I want to ask a question about incentives uh, for uh, reducing, no, eliminating uh, fossil fuels from buildings, which I think your, uh, your graph showed 60% yeah. uh, in Portland. Um, and what would the incentives look like to move toward that? In fact, moved all the way to 100% uh, in the next 30 years. So we're still certainly working on all the details. I mean, ultimately, I think the uh, goal is to be moving towards an you know, electrified economy. Um, so if we can move, you know, develop, um, you know, certainly heat pumps are a great solution for some types of infrastructure. Some some buildings will benefit greatly. So um, you know, there's currently incentives through Efficiency Maine, and I 
expect that the, the, the incentives uh, for that, for fee pumps will even improve more than they are now. Um, but, you know, some, you know, heating, you know, larger buildings will, may have more of a challenge. Um, and so we'll have to work closely with, um, with the, the building and design community and, the, and to think about what technology is going to be the most effective for a, for a commercial industrial process. I mean, electrifying as much as we can and then look for a solution for uh, what parts of the economy that can't be electrified, whether that look like, whether that's like hydrogen or, or some other type of um, fuel storage. Um, but it's, it's going to be a, a difficult proposition, no question. Uh, but you know, certainly think you know, electri electri electrification is certainly a huge step in the right direction, especially since you know we'll be having 100% renewable electricity by 2050. So anything we can move on to the electrical grid, as opposed to um, you know a, a liquid fuel, will be will be a benefit. So, but I, I don't know what the other incentives will look like yet. Certainly, and there'll have to be some, you know, if not you know at least state level incentives and. Maybe at some point we can actually get some federal incentives as well, because you know certainly the city won't have the financial resources to provide you know a lot of you know financial incentive to um, upgrade someone's building system. But um, you know we can look for you know better policy at the at the state and federal level. So does that imply that uh, since Governor Mills has made a commitment to mm -hmm. this, that she's assuming that uh, the state will be funding? Uh, incentives to the level that uh, will accomplish this goal? I don't, I don't know. I, I guess I mean, I'm sure answer is I don't know the answer to that. And I think, you know, right now the state is working, they have the Climate Council that's coming together and they're working on the state climate action plan, which is um, due, I think, in December. Um, and so I think we'll have some more answers um, at that point um, of what the governor has in mind. Yeah. They don't need to beat a dead horse, but I think that, you know, in response to the, what you just asked, um, there, are, there are a lot of cities who have already made it a requirement for new construction to conform to, whether it's LEED or whether it's, you know, some other building standards. So it's hard, you know, it's hard for me to hear you say that they don't have the tools in the toolbox yet, because there's a lot of standards that are out there that would already, you know, commit the developers of buildings. And, you know, it seems to me that a city of this size, you know, it's not building a ton of public buildings. Right. A lot of cities like the city of Philadelphia, Chattanooga, Tennessee, I mean, there's a, there are countless examples at this point. New York City yeah. have all required a certain minimum standard for any of the buildings that are city buildings or state buildings. But, you know, in a, in a place like Portland, where there are probably not too many of those, mm -hmm. you know, that, are, that really would have a meaningful impact, there certainly could, seems to me, there could be a size, you know, benchmark that anything over 10,000 feet, let's just say, to throw out an example, you know, has has a performance requirement, and, and those tools exist. I mean, you know, yeah, the city yeah. can really shift that burden to the people who are developing buildings mm -hmm. without having to pay for it themselves. That can be a requirement. Right, I think that's that's what we're working to in the in the regulatory environment we've had to date. The city hasn't been able to require performance greater than MUBEC, the main uniform building code. So, with the adoption, when so in the last session we were able to get the state to allow cities to adopt a, a stretch code, which I expect we will do. But there's um, so much more. There's water conservation. Right, right, but yeah. there's a, there's a ton of other issues yeah. that are you know. Into air quality. I mean, there are a lot yeah. of things that are just not just energy. So right. I'm not sure why the city doesn't push it. It seems sort of inconsistent. Right. Well, I mean, like I said, that's it's in our we're we're starting that work. Should we have started earlier? One might can argue that we should have started earlier, but now you know, we're starting that conversation. We're starting to put wanting to put those tools in the toolbox and and have started working with the planning board and the council on on developing those. So. Any other questions? Well, great. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. And, uh, and stay tuned. Again, follow us uh, on Instagram, Sustainable Portland, Maine, and uh, oneclimatefuture.org. So thanks again.